get by It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See life's like a peach If you find the sand And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders and how they overcome big challenges in life and business, like the founders of P90X, Atari, and Quest Nutrition. Tom Bilyeu from Quest talks about how he helped build what is now valued at a billion dollar company and about the story when he was broke and he had to convince his father or future father-in-law that he would support his daughter. Uh, our sponsor today is Rise25.com, where entrepreneurs of six, seven, and eight figure businesses come together live and in person every few months to solve their biggest business challenges and leave with lifelong friendships. Check out Rise25.com. It's run by myself and co founder John Corcoran, and it's application only. Today, I'm very excited. We have Brianna Borton, and uh, she's built three spas into an eight figure business encompassing a variety of wellness products, including nutritional supplements and the life planner called the Dream Book, which she'll talk about. She's co founder of The Dragon Tree. She's also author of The Well Life How to Use Structure, Sweetness, and Space to Create Balance, Happiness, and Peace. Brianna, thanks so much for joining me. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. So I want to talk about Montana and other things, but I have to ask about the title. How did you come up with the title? It's so interesting because I'm reading, you know, I was doing the research, The Well Life. I'm like, okay, how do you structure sweetness and space to create balance, happiness, and peace? How do you come up with the title? <laughs> well, we really, like The Well Life was kind of a play on, you know, the good life because um, so many people, you know, think that that's their goal. You know, they want to have like all of the things, like the American dream, the good life. Right, right. And right. What I we love have, that. Okay, yeah. <laughs> and what we realize is that it's actually like so much more important to have a well life, a yes. life that's really balanced and peaceful and loving and connected. Sure. And so um, that's kind of how we came up with it. And also just because we, like so much of our work is around wellness and expanding that definition of wellness to incorporate more than just a healthy body and mind, but to incorporate being able to, you know, expand out and get, you know, your dreams and your goals, not just like by killing yourself, but by with a maintaining balance at the same time. Yeah. So that's how we came up with that name. Yeah. And we're going to dig into this, the book a little bit. You know, someone was, I think a couple weeks ago, and I had never heard this quote. I'm sure it's been around for centuries. You've probably heard it. I'm going to butcher it. So you may have to correct me, but you know, if you don't have your health or, you know, you know what I'm talking about? If you have your health, you have a million wishes. And if you don't have your health, you have one wish. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And that goes into this. So what's your favorite story from the well life, from the book? Oh, wow. Um, the, my favorite story. Hmm. I mean, I feel like a lot of what I, like one of my one of my favorite things to talk about is integrity and how we keep integrity and how we can keep our word and how we clean things up. Mm -hmm. And so one of my favorite stories in our book that just like came to me and you asked that question was around a therapist that we had who worked for us for not that long. Like she had just gotten the job and she didn't show up for work. Like I think it was actually her first day and she didn't show up for work. Gotta love it. (laughs) Right. And she was but like we had loved her in the interview process. Like she was so like perfect. She like fit our culture so well. She was a great right. therapist. She was like such a wonderful person. Yeah. And so the fact that she didn't show up was like such a blow to us. And she didn't call. She just didn't come in. And we had to like rearrange everything. And she came to us the next day, like when she got her things, she had, had been up in the mountains. She had gotten it wrong in her calendar, her starting day. And I think a lot of people in that situation would be like, sorry, I got it wrong. And, you know, and I'd be like, well, now I don't trust you. But she took it so much further and really cleaned it up with us. She came in. She apologized immediately. She brought cookies. She apologized to everyone who had affected. She, like, Mm. found out who covered for her, found out who was involved, like, really got involved. And she had so much integrity around it that we were like, yeah, of course you're still hired because you – didn't just you weren't just like oh whatever that's not a big deal she like really dove in and and was a a real human with us and she actually still works for us she's amazing she's been with us for i think 10 and a half years now and you know i think that the reason that that story is just because i think that there's so many people that have all these dreams they're not willing to have 
integrity to follow up and you know keep those relationships going and really do what they say they're gonna do so it's probably one of my favorite stories that is crazy what um it sounds like you have a really you call it loving uh hiring process and i love that what does that look like yeah, so we do a lot of hiring. I actually don't do as much hiring as I used to because now we have, you know, a lot of people who do all the hiring for us, but we have a really great process where we really want to talk about like our mission and making sure that the people that are, you know, joining us for on our team are also on the same page as us as far as our mission and our desires and hopes for the world. And so we spend a ton of time, well, we do a lot of testing first. So mm-hmm. I, I have like a whole system for how we hire people, but most yeah. of the things that we do beforehand are testing for skills and those kinds mm-hmm. of things through the application process and the interview process that we do on the phone or via email. And then once people get in front of us, like for, you know, the actual interview, mm-hmm. we always are just trying to confirm likability or like how mm-hmm. they're going to fit into right. our culture right. rather than, you know, ability because, we already know they have the capacity once they're in front of us. Um, And so then we just really want to spend the time making sure that they feel like this is really what they want to do with their life and that they feel like they want to join a team that is so committed to creating more peace in the world because we really hold them to it. And we want to make sure that they're going to feel good about that and we're going to feel good about that. Yeah. What's an example of a test that other people maybe could use for their own hiring process? Yeah, I mean, we have so many, and I actually, I encourage people to have at least three tests for Mm -hmm. people before they end up in front of you. But we do, you know, our first test starts with our application process. So if it's for, say, a receptionist, where they have to be very detail-oriented around how to schedule things and when to schedule things and Mm -hmm. how to do every, I mean, it's just so much. And so in our application process, we have on the job posting, we'll always say, we want you to send us your resume in this format. So we'll say like in Mm -hmm. a doc with your name as a title, we want you to send it with a separate cover letter that's a PDF, and we want you to send it to us between one and three on this day. Mm -hmm. And so we only accept resumes between one and three on that day. We don't, like if they send it before, if they send it after, we know that they just aren't capable of being detail oriented to the degree that we need them to be. Right. And so, you know, then those people in their cover letter will be like, you'll find that I'm very detail oriented. I'm like, no, you're not. <laughs> you definitely are not. And like, the thing is, is that we want to put our best foot forward, right? Yeah. And so we will say all these things. But at the same time, you can really test somebody to find out if those things are actually true. Yeah. Um, and if you don't do that, then when you find out later that they were just like, full of baloney in their interview, then it's not really their fault. It's your fault for not like doing the things to right. make sure that that's right. the truth. So what made you decide to write that book now, The Well Life? You know, it, Peter and I just felt like we didn't, we almost felt like we didn't have a choice. It was such a calling for us. Um, because we had been working with clients in a more specifically health-related way. You know, yeah. Peter's an acupuncturist and doctor of oriental medicine, and yeah. I have an Ayurvedic background, and so we've worked with patients and clients so much, and we put out a survey, actually, and we were like, how can we, as the Dragon Tree, help you more beyond, you know, our spas mm. and beyond our tinctures, and, you know, what are you really suffering with? currently or what are you struggling with and the main thing we heard people come back to us with was when I'm there I feel so in balance and when Hmm. I'm using your products I feel so at peace but I'm not I don't know how to take that into the rest of my life Hmm. and I really don't Realm and not being able to get my goals and not knowing how to like create my life. And we see you two doing that. How do we do that? Mm. And so Peter and I really felt like, well, if this is what you want from us, of course we will provide it. And so we actually created our dream book first. Mm-hmm. which is kind of like a tool and a framework for doing this work. Mm-hmm. And then we wrote The Well Life to just go deeper into that so that we could help people, you know, not just with the health stuff, which we do cover like kind of basic health things to like, 
you have to be healthy at like a baseline in order to do anything else. Right. And then we go into, you know, like having a spiritual connection and creating goals from like a really aligned place and how to move forward with that and how to create community. So it's a very thorough book. We're not the kind of people that like hold anything back. So yeah. it's like everything that we felt like we could provide at this moment to help people create that in their own lives. Yeah. I love that, that you just went out, you surveyed your customers and kind of went to see how else can we serve you. Um, and did anything else influence what was in the book based off of the conversations or feedback? Yeah, definitely. I mean, we really specifically, you know, people were saying that they wanted to know how to create their goals. And so a lot, there's a lot of things, a lot in the book about that. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, and then a lot of the, you know, we have this one section that's called the eight steps for, you know, fundamental health. Mm -hmm. And we, they were the eight things that we really see lacking the most. And mm. so most universally true health principles. Yeah. And so um, we included that in the book because we felt like, well, we can't, as healthcare practitioners, really write, write a book for you about how to like create your dream life without addressing these things because right. it's so important. And so that's why um, those are in there. And actually right now when people buy our book, they get we actually went deeper into those and created a little mini course that people get mm. for free when they buy our book now, which is, has been actually really fun to like dive into more just because, you know, there can be kind of, you know, there are things that you know, like you should get enough sleep and you should play and you should have community, like these mm. kinds of things, but like why? And are those some of the eight steps? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I, what were a I, few? Yeah. T- talk about a few of those. Yeah, so some of, you know, one of them is like play and laughter and making sure that you have that in your everyday life, that there's, it's not just, you know, (laughs) it's not just for fun. It's actually really important for your success. It's really important for your health. And, you know, it's also really important for your relationships to make sure that you are incorporating that into your life. Um, Another one that we talk about is being in nature and how so many of us have, created nature as this kind of like scenery that we like look at from like right. the inside of You're our like cars in the car like, right yeah. exactly or like our nice view from our house maybe but you know actually being in nature and connecting there and learning the rhythms and seeing it in like in real life like you can't not you can't be unpresent to nature and learn about it at the same time so how do we get people back into nature and really back into the flow that happens when you're connected in that way. Mm-hmm. So those are a couple more, and, you know, there's eight of them. And I think that they're really, they're the things that we see. So, um, degrading the quality of people's lives. Are any of the eight controversial? Like some people don't agree with them. Um, I don't think so. No, I, I mean, mean to anyone like, oh, I don't know if that's so important. I mean, do you get any pushback from people? Um, I definitely, I, the main pushback I hear all the time yeah. is always, um, well, I don't have time yeah. to do all of that. I don't know how you like do I don't it, have time to I walk in the time. forest. I have three kids. I have a job and all this other stuff. Like that kind of thing? Yeah. 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 What or like them? one of them is stillness and it's like about like being still, meditating, mm-hmm. and like getting to like mm-hmm. the connection and, you know, people all the time say they don't have time for that. Right. And, you know, I... I have like a little bit of a tough love approach yeah. in that way yeah. where I'm like, look, I have two children. I have basically like five businesses. I have lots of property I have to take care of. I have a huge community. I have a family. You know, I have all of these things too. Yeah. So I'm not saying that you don't. I'm also, I'm just saying that like, yes, I get it. And also you have to make sure that you're doing these things and you can either happen or you can make excuses but you it's up to you i can't i can't find the time for you you first just have to be really willing and then you'll see you'll figure it out because you definitely can figure it out you just have to like be more willing to figure it out than you are to be right about the fact that you can't do it right i mean you have two kids family five businesses so many moving parts how do you structure your day to get everything done that you need to get done. And you seem so calm, by the way. So, 
Yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, I, you know, our, my day is structured a little bit different every day. I yeah. mean, I have some things that are very routine for me, yeah. and then a lot of things that are very flexible. So we have a lot of rituals in our life that yeah. help kind of create the structure part mm-hmm. so that the other parts can be really fluid. So mm-hmm. I wake up in the morning and I do, you know, my morning rituals of meditation and mm-hmm. connecting with my girls and my husband. So what time do you usually, I, is there a typical wake-up time or just depends when your girls wake you up? Um, there, I mean, usually I wake up around 8, which mm-hmm. I know is like so late for everyone else. I'm I like, love that I you love said that. I'm, I'm so sick of people saying five making me feel horrible. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, seriously, yeah, I, yeah. I agree. I, everyone yeah. feels like, I think that there's like this thing in our culture. It's like, I mean, it, there's definitely the like early bird gets the worm. And I'm kind of like, yeah, I don't know. There's all these studies that show like it, that's not really true. You know, you can be a late owl, like a night owl and right. be just as successful. And mm-hmm. I really... I really encourage people to know their own rhythms and start to feel yeah. that because for me, my yeah. husband and I love to stay up late. Like we just yeah. always do. We connect a lot during for that sure. time. Yeah. We talk during that time. And so I'm not going to, I'm not going to change my whole routine yeah. to, um, to like fit into our culture, like norms of what is you're supposed to do. So yeah. I usually wake up around, I mean, sometimes I wake up around seven thirty, eight. That's yeah. like generally between those two times. Um, and so, yes. Um, and then we, you know, we have tried to do my morning meditation and connect with my daughters to make sure that they, you know, the first minutes that we're all awake together, that we are loving and creating together before we go out into our days. Um, I'll need your advice on that with a two year old too. So like sometimes the loving part doesn't happen, you know, there's screaming and things like that. So. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean i think for me we just really try to create it as like part of our family culture and I yeah think what do you do that, yeah <laughs> tell me you know we we really i think it helps helps that we have an older daughter who has already fallen into the family culture of yeah. really connecting and cuddling and like how important it is in the morning to like pay attention to everyone in the family like usually they all come into our bed and then mm-hmm. we'll connect in bed and just like cuddle and talk and like tickle and be physical with each other and I think that that especially for my two-year-old and it's how it started with my nine-year-old is like the, the gateway of like tickling wrestling and like playfulness is mm-hmm. like the gateway into like snuggles and like a little bit of calm time together right so usually that's how we, you know, approach it. Though every day, of course, with a child is different because they, you know, change all the time. So, right. um, for sure. And then we, and then we usually actually are like pretty. We need to like get up, get dressed, kind of quickly to get our daughter to school. So we get up, get dressed, make breakfast, um, make our lunch. Ha- eat together and then you know then I usually go after we get her to school I then usually go work out for about an hour and then I start my work day so I usually start my work day around 10 yeah um and I know that that's like probably much later than a lot of people um but you could just wake up earlier if you had to be at work I guess at eight um but I really appreciate being able to have that kind of flexibility in my own life just because I'm so much more, I'm like so creative at night and so like wanting to connect with Peter during that time that I, I can't get to bed by 10. There's just no way. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I agree. And so those are like kind of like the touch points in the morning and then in the evening we have dinner all together and then like uh, some reading time and some singing and then bedtime. So we usually try to keep some the, those structure pieces, not just for yeah. us, but also for our children, so that yeah. then we can like flow differently throughout the day as needed. Yeah. So, Brand, talk about 10 a.m. on because you're managing five businesses. So, talk about some of the businesses you have to work on during that that time frame between 10 and then and dinner. Well, um, so we have our apothecary, which yes. is our business that we create um, bath and body products. We also have an herbal tincture line yeah. and then we have um, external pain relief products. Yeah. So um, I spend time on that business quite often. You know, they it's manufactured in Portland and I am in Boulder. Oh, nice. So um, yeah, so I don't 
you know, I'm not at the manufacturing facility, though we do visit a lot to make sure that, you know, everything's running right and yes. everyone's identifying herbs correctly and, you know, all of those things. Yes. But, um, you know, usually during the day I check in on that business and we, you know, there's all sorts of things to be like naming things, pricing things, figuring out deals with retailers, yeah. um, writing contracts. Um, and I, I usually am just the person okaying all of that at this right. point. Yeah. Um, but you know, I do, you know, yesterday we met with like a major company and I go to that meeting, how, you know, <laughs> do all of the presenting. And, um, so that is part of my work. Then we have our whole lifestyle aspect of our company. So our dream book and planner and our course that goes with that. I'm often, you know, participating with our dream book participants, um, you know, answering questions for them, making sure that our dream books are printed and shipping and, you know, people are asking questions. And so, you know, we have customer service people, but if they don't know the answer, then, you know, I'm stepping in and helping them with those things. Um, And then the course, like making sure that it's all people are getting in, getting access and going through it. And, you know, when they have questions, those all come to Peter and myself. Um, right now we're working a ton on our book launch. Um, so, you know, doing podcast interviews like this or, um, writing articles and, you know, meeting with our publisher, meeting with our publicist. Um, so a lot of those kinds of meetings, making sure that we have our launch parties planned and all of those moving parts, which is a huge amount of work. Um, then we also have our online programs, so just like making sure that they're functioning right, that our ads are running, that people are getting what they need to get, and that you know everyone's happy in that world. Um, and then our spas are the other aspect yeah. of our business. The spas, I mean, that alone is like a crazy <laughs> amount of work. You leave that yeah. like as, oh, by the way, we have these three spas. But, <laughs> and then um, we have three spas. Yeah. Yeah, so, and, you know, I ha- I feel really grateful. I have a really wonderful team. Each spa has a spa director, and then we have a COO who, you know, is their manager. Mm-hmm. So I mostly meet with him and make sure that our numbers are all working right and that, you know, menus are printed correctly and everyone, you know, there's always questions. Therapists always have, like, new things that they want to be different. So right. approving or disapproving those things and, right. you know, changing. We we always look at our structure and improve as we can, make sure that we're being competitive um, with other spas and then also making sure that our clients are ridiculously happy. So yeah. um, usually they're ridiculously happy and I don't have to do anything. And if they're not and it gets to be with me, then I get to exercise my... Um, my customer service skills, which is actually one of my favorite things to do. So, mm-hmm. I mean, I never like it when people are unhappy, but generally, that's people are generally really unhappy if they come if they get to me. Um, right. And so it's always I always love that. I mean, I love that they're unhappy, but I love getting thing. to work with them to make them happy. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I want to talk. What's the most popular product on the Dragon Tree line? Oh, well, it's kind of different because our yeah. prob- our definitely our like most popular thing that we sell is our dream book. We sell mm. just um, incredible amounts of them. So that is the main, that's like the number one thing that we sell. Mm. Um, and then in our apothecary line, the number one thing that we sell is our muscle melt line. Mm. So we have yeah, I saw that. all of yeah. yeah. So probably our, either our muscle melt patch or our muscle melt liniment, they are both I mean, they compete with each other for being our number one seller all the time. Um, And they're both really wonderful products that help people so much that I think that, um, you know, I think that there's like a slightly viral component to that as well where people use it and it helps Mm -hmm. so much that they are spreading the word about it. Unlike a lotion, like if you really love your lotion, you're just like not that likely to tell somebody about it. Yeah, it's like, (laughs) yeah. Yeah. That's true. So we, we sell a lot of that too, but, you know, our muscle melt is definitely, I think because it changes people's lives, right? Like if you couldn't move your shoulder and now you can move your shoulder, you talk about that. Right. <laughs> oh, for sure. Um, and then you said you work with some retailers. Where, where can people find the products? So right now we're in mostly um, other spas and oh, nice. um, a lot of clinics. So, you know, acupuncture clinics and chiropractic clinics. Yeah. Um, some naturopathic clinics, and then we also have our products in places, in, mostly in the Northwest, I guess, probably because that's where we started in. Like, um, gee, I don't know if you know about New Seasons, but it's kind of like the Northwest version of Whole Foods, but mm. much more local. Got so it. Those kinds of stores you can find us in as well. Yeah, nice. I thought I read somewhere at one point were you in Whole Foods 
or we we were we were in Whole Foods on the East Coast, okay. um, and so we started there, and then we were like, this doesn't make any sense to be on the other side of the country to start with, because you know there's just so much support you have to offer. Right. So we actually kind of we pulled out and yeah. regrouped and decided to move back over to the West Coast and start there and then go toward the East Coast instead of starting yeah. there and having to send so many people to support our products there. So, yeah. Um, How did that come about? Was someone just demanding it on the East Coast? Yeah. And, you know, my husband's from Boston and we were mm-hmm. visiting there and he just went to, he was like, I'm just going to stop by the headquarters. They were like, this is not how it's done. And he like, was like, cares? whatever. Right. Yeah. And so he, he like met the woman and she liked him a lot. And, you know, it just kind of all happened. And it was really great. And it was a really great experience. And we learned a ton about what we want to do and how we want to do it. But we also realized that it was costing just a ton of money to be in Whole Foods. Yeah. So we were like, let's pull back, regroup, decide what the course of action we want to take right. and then you know maybe approach it again but um it's actually very expensive to be in whole foods yeah talk so. about that because most people think oh my god that's the one i'll be all they got in whole foods their life is figured out what's the yeah. what's the what did you find well, there's, they, they require a lot. You know, they require a whole lot of free product up front. So, mm. it's, um, so they use that, and everyone has to do this. So for every product that you have in there, you, for every store that you're in, you have to offer, you know, X number of free products to start. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, for us, we were in, I think it was like 25 Whole Foods on yeah. the East Coast to start with. Yeah. Yeah, and so with that though, you have to provide twenty free products for all of those places, and yeah. so it's a lot. And then you have to offer a lot of support as far as training, and then being um, being there and doing like sample testing, mm. like at the tables. You need you know, someone you there, those people there to drive yeah. the sales. Yeah. Yeah, and so there's it's just it's a lot of work and your margins are not super great because usually they want you to then be in UNFI, which is their distributor. So you have to give distributing pr- distributor pricing to UNFI and then mm. to Whole Foods. There's a lot of middle foods. people. Yeah. And it's, you know, I think it's worth it if that's what, if you are, if that's the plan mm. and you can attack it in the right way. Mm. Um, but I would say like for us, even just starting on a local level and making sure that it's more than one product and that you are getting, you know, the attention that you need and that you can provide the attention that is necessary to get it to take off. Yeah. And so, um, we realized that, you know, it, hadn't, we, it was very hard for us to have somebody in all of those 25 oh, stores, yeah. you know, every week checking to make sure for that, sure. like, our product is still being displayed the way it needs to be. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that it's always wise to um, find out more because I think that it's true. We all think, like, Whole Foods, that's great, or, you right. know, Walmart, that would be amazing. And yet, like, when you really look into it, sometimes those numbers just don't you work could out. Kill someone's and, business. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You've had a crazy history of breaking bones. Okay. So <laughs> tell me how you met your husband. <laughs> well, we worked together at a spa and we were okay. friends, um, flirty friends, I would say. Yeah. And um, I actually think I, I, he still denies us, but okay. I feel like um, he. What happened is that he, I was sitting on this cart that we used at the spot. It was like very rickety and I knew it. And he grabbed my feet to kind of twirl me around like this really flirty way, but I knew it was super rickety. So I was like, no, no, no. And I fell and I hit my tailbone on the cement floor and I, I and broke it and oh screamed in the spa very loudly. <laughs> and, Something you do um, not want going on in a spa. <laughs> like why is someone no, screaming in the other No, it's so bad. Um, and so he took me, you know, to a treatment room and proceeded to like, you know, massage my tailbone for like an hour with this liniment. And I mm-hmm. still to this day, I'm like, I think you did that on purpose. Exactly. I, I see broke right my tailbone that. Exactly. just so that you could rub my butt all day and get to know me more <laughs> than I would like you. So <laughs> it worked. Um, it, yeah, he, that night he came to my house with a watermelon and my favorite muffin and like took care of me. And I was like, you know, 
then it, it was all it was all downhill yes. or uphill. It was <laughs> all it was all the stories the told stuff. from there. Right, right. <laughs> um, and then when you were eighteen, also, I, I was reading your your about page, and I, and that just stopped me in my tracks. Yeah. What happened? Yeah. Wow. Breaking Bones really does like seem yeah. to shape my life quite a bit. Yeah. Um, Hopefully, yeah, no more was... in your future. Yes. <laughs> no more. I'm feeling really good about yes. the direction nowadays. Yes. So let's keep it. Um, yeah. So when I was 18, I was going to art school. I had just moved to Washington with my best friend. We'd just gotten our house and unpacked and I was about to start art school and I decided that I really missed my boyfriend. Mm. So we drove, we got in the car and drove from Polsbo, Washington back to Montana. Mm -hmm. And as we were outside of Spokane, I was sleeping because it was late at night and my friend swerved to miss a porcupine and we got into a major car accident. And I broke my neck. And oh, that that's horrible. Yeah, I mean, it's so funny because now I'm like, I'm so glad it happened that I, you know, when people people often are like, oh, that's so hard or so sad. And I'm like, it's it was at the time definitely hard. But now looking back, it is such a pivotal moment in my life that I'm so grateful for it. And just it changed everything. So... I never got to go back to that house in Polsbo. I never even set foot in that school that I was um, mm. signed up to go to. You and stayed at I home had, in Montana at the time. Yeah, I Just moved back yeah. into it with my parents and was in a neck brace. And, <sighs> you know, I really reevaluated what was important and what wasn't important and how I wanted my life to go since I got really clear that it could just end at any time. Mm, right. And, I talk about this so often with people because, and people think I'm so morbid. They're like, you shouldn't be talking about death all the time. I'm like, we should be talking about death. It is like the number one thing that happens to all of us, no matter what. And the fact that we are so afraid to even talk about it shows us how our culture is so messed up in the way that we think about it. It's like, it's inevitable. So let's talk about it and also get really real about what we want to do while we're alive because you don't know when yeah. it's going to happen. And it just became so clear to me. And so from there, I was like, I, you know, if I died tomorrow without going to college, I wouldn't be that sad. But if I died tomorrow without going to Europe, I would be really sad. So right. I got home, I saved all my money, I bought a ticket to Europe, I went and traveled for a year, mm. lived in the Czech Republic, ran a hostel, wow. got really into like the healing arts. And, um, so you yeah, got into the healing did, arts there in Europe? Well, actually, it started in Montana because when I had my neck was broken, the yeah. only thing that helped the pain was massage. Yeah. And so... I mean, I've I really seen you, started, obviously, in video and things, like you're walking around. Um, so, I mean, anyone who's listening to this, Um, did you have, was there like swelling on the spinal cord or was there any effects of, of that or how did the, how did the break affect you? Yeah. So, um, I have actually like the same fracture that Christopher Reeves had. Really? Um, are you serious? Yeah. Like, oh my God. Yeah. Almost identical and just really lucky that my fracture slid sideways instead of sliding either to the front or to the back, which would have been devastating. And so, you know, obviously it was really important to make sure that my neck was demobilized so that I couldn't move, so that it couldn't fracture or or so it couldn't shift and move forward or backwards. So that was the main concern for the eight months that I was in my neck brace while it was healing. That is crazy, um, Brianna. Wow. Yeah, I'm really, I'm just so lucky. I never had any lack of uh, yeah. mobility. And, you know, I really feel so blessed that it was, yeah. you know, it's just like a shift in life, but I was able to keep my health and my mobility. And, you know, I really feel like it also, re- it really woke something up in me too. So that is um, an awakening, if anything. It, it, is, is, it yeah. is the awakening. Yeah. So when do you you go from this healing and then obviously getting into the healing arts and um, so at what point do you open your first spa? So from there, I moved. I said I like was living in Europe, moved back to the United States because yeah. my sister was having a baby. I didn't want to miss that. Yeah. So um, came back here and moved to Portland with my boyfriend at the time, 
and um, worked a lot of odd jobs and decided to become a massage therapist for real and yeah. went to school. I was a massage therapist in my private practice and at a spa for about a year and a half, actually. Yeah. You know, not that long. And I was working at the spa that I met my husband at. Yeah. And I loved it. I like loved the people. It was really good. But I always had all these ideas for how it needed how it could be improved. Mm. Yeah. So like what? Like, oh, what we was, should have Yeah. You know, like we did foot massages pretty much exclusively and I was like, Oh, we should offer neck packs for people while we give them foot massages because mm. then that would be like warm and relaxing and so nice and so easy to do. Um, or I'd be like, I think that we should offer like this treatment or I think we should change the schedule like this. I mean, I was pretty much all the annoying. requests you get <laughs> 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 that you're like, no, 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 no. <laughs> yeah. So my boss at the time always just said, you know, if you think you can do it better, do it yourself. Right. And I say that and it sounds like she was being so snarky, but I actually think she genuinely meant it. Like yeah. she was like a really lovely person. Yeah. And I think she was really like, I'm not going to do all this shit you want me to do. So just go do it yourself. Exactly. Get out of my um, yeah. So eventually they fired me, which I totally get now because I would totally fire me. Um, <laughs> it was like a very challenging employee. Um, and I was like, you know what? I think I am going to start my own spa. So I was 22 and I was like so wow. sure of myself, going, even yeah. though I had like literally zero money. I'd never even had a credit card. Like had like <laughs> no way of doing this. And I was like, I'm going to do it myself. So yeah. I uh, decided that I would. I wrote a business plan. I thought, oh, I'm going to write a business plan. People will just give me money, which didn't happen. Um, <laughs> so we definitely opened on a shoestring budget. Yeah. Um, my husband had some credit cards that he, like some credit card credit that I used. Yeah. Um, I had a business partner uh, for a little while. We borrowed money from her family. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, we opened on very little mm -hmm. money. Was the money and for oh, just the build out or what? Yeah, I mean, build out. I mean, opening a spa is expensive. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's there's so much you have to do. Um, and we did it incrementally there because we yeah. really couldn't do everything at the, yeah. at the beginning because we didn't have the money. Yeah. So, you know, we built out rooms and, you know, we had a sink for the foot baths and a sink to wash our hands and we painted and we did like everything. I sewed yeah. all the curtains. I really? painted all the walls. Wow. I, you know, made all the foot bath carts with my husband by our, with our own hands. I mean, like, Everything we did everything ourselves because we really had no money. Um, we didn't start with having any um, amenities. We didn't have showers or saunas or anything that we have now. Right. And we just opened knowing that we really cared and that we wanted right. to create an environment that people felt loved in and also wanted to offer really therapeutic treatments. Right. And so we were really clear about our objective and. Yeah, luckily, then I bought my business partner's half of her business a year into it because it was really not a great fit. Yeah. And um, then we were able to make enough money that we were able to get a loan. Then we were able to add on the amenities and, you know, finally finish some of the rooms. I mean, there were rooms in our spa when we first opened that we were built, but we couldn't, we didn't have enough money to, like, get you know, decorations in and a table mm. in and all those things. So we just closed the doors. I get that. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. That door is just closed for now until right. we can figure it out. Um, so, yeah, it was definitely a ton of hard work. But, it, yeah. you know, luckily I didn't have – I had a lot of ambition and a lot of energy. And I was only – by the time we opened, I was 23 and yeah. didn't have kids yet. And I could do that. Yeah. What worked and what didn't work? for getting because now you you have all this time energy money and you still need to get clients in the door you know yeah <laughs> yeah it's really true um you know it's hard to say what works and doesn't work it you know because we have so many different aspects of our business and yeah. some things work for one aspect right, and yeah some things work for another aspect like facebook ads kill it for us for selling our dream book yeah. facebook ads do not that well for us for getting people new clients into our spas. Right. So, you know, and, you know, we're always testing it, so eventually we will figure out a Facebook ads way of right. doing it. Um, but so far, you know, but what does really work for us for getting people in the door is to create really solid relationships with the people that already have come in. So yeah. we spend the majority of our money 
that we would normally spend on marketing on taking care of the people who have already mm-hmm. come in. So whether that's sending them gifts or sending them gift certificates mm-hmm. or, you know, making sure that we're reaching out to them and reminding mm-hmm. them how much they love us so that they share with mm-hmm. their friends. Yeah. Um, that actually, you know, it's kind of like, I kind of feel like it's like old school marketing, but it works so well yeah. because it's actually genuine relationships that you're building. And I think that all really good marketing is genuine relationship building. Yeah. How did you get those initial people in the door to, so you could build those relationships? Yeah. I mean, for us, we had some people in our private practices in massage already because hmm. I had been having my private practice for yeah. about a year and a half already. Yeah. So I had some people you already. Have a base and to work off of. Yeah. yeah. But really when I say some people, I really mean like 10. Yeah. So there weren't a it's lot. a start. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But those 10 people, you know, we just treated them so well and asked them yeah. so often to help yeah. us. What's something and that you that should do, like something you did to treat them like royalty that they were just wild about? Um, well, we'd throw parties for them, and especially mm-hmm. in the beginning, there weren't very many people. So, and we would have it catered, and we would make sure that you know they had wine, and we'd get them free treatments, mm-hmm. and we'd ask them to bring in their friends, yeah. and we'd treat their friends super yeah, well. Smart, yeah. So that was um, one of the beginning things that we yeah. did. Um, and then you know we always quarterly at the beginning we don't do this anymore, but we would sell, send them gift certificates for them and a gift certificate for them to give to a friend with it being a gift from them. Right. So it looked just like a gift card with their name as the from, you know, it's like yeah. for like $50. So they could be the person getting, getting the credit for giving the gift. Yeah. Well, for us, That's we're right. getting a new client out of it. Right. Um, so a lot of things like that. We also, you know, did a lot of like checking in on them and making sure that their service was really great and following up and we always write thank yous to everyone who comes in to just say you know thank you for coming in and now you know as we've grown we have a lot more systems in place for you know we send them stretching videos we send them meditations we send them things to support their lifestyle after they come in Mm -hmm. so that they remember they feel like we are supporting them throughout the process that they keep remembering us and coming back right and when does the airport come into play so we opened the airport spa um, in 2009, mm-hmm. and it's kind of an interesting, um, a li- we had a little bit of an interesting road to get there because in 2007, we um, opened our a cafe, which was right next door to the spa because mm. we were having our first daughter, um, Sabina, and I didn't want I didn't want to be away from her, right. but I needed to be at the spa. And you can't bring a baby into a spa. It's just like horrible idea. Not a great idea. So <laughs> I was yeah. like, a better idea. The anti relaxation. No. Yeah, the anti relaxation crying baby. <laughs> Um, so I thought a better idea would be to open a cafe next door, obviously, and That's so obvious. Yeah. so that I can bring my you baby need to more work. work. And, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so we opened the cafe two weeks before she was born, um, which is crazy. And wow. then I could bring her to work with me because I created an office in the back of the cafe where she could be and I could be with her and I could be right, I was right next door to the spot. They actually connected yeah. through a door. Um, they don't anymore because we have had, since then sold the cafe, yeah. which we did because we were approached by the airport asking us, I actually kind of like specifically like just asking us to like open a spa there. Um, But what really happened is that they wanted us to make a proposal to open a spa there, which we did and lots of other people did. Um, And then found out what amazing bureaucratic tape there can be in the world. And I was like, this is so hard. Um, But, you know, I'm determined and uh, it's like, I'm going to do it. So um, we won that contract, which was really amazing. amazing. And in the process, it was really competitive. yeah, really competitive. Um, we decided to sell the cafe so that we could focus more on the spas um, and be more in line with yeah. what we really feel like our purpose is. Yeah. So um, we won the contract in 2008, and we opened like in the beginning of 2009. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's obvious advantages, right? There's huge amounts of traffic. What were the disadvantages of being in the in the airport? Um, the disadvantages 
are that you don't really have as much control as you normally would. Mm -hmm. You know, your hours are really set by other people. Mm -hmm. Your um, services, the prices are... the. Well, Portland Airport is different than a lot of airports, but they make sure that all of their businesses have street pricing, which means you can't charge more in the airport than you do anywhere else. Mm -hmm. And so, which I think is actually really wonderful. I'm so grateful they do that. But on the other hand, it's expensive to run a business in the airport. Oh, yeah. Because you have to pay for all the parking for all of your employees. You have to pay for their security badging. You have to pay for them to do background checks on all of them. You have to pay for, like, it goes on and on and on and on yeah. and on. And so it's much more expensive to run a business in the airport, yeah. and yet, like, you can't charge more at the Portland airport, right. which is great. And I, I think that the Portland airport and the people who run it are phenomenal humans doing really great work, yeah. and I think that... That has is like the only thing that got me through all the bureaucracy because it's so hard for me because I'm used to being like I'll just do whatever I want. Right. Um. Not so much there. Like I was like I really want to have um, um. You know those like pedal bikes that you can put people in and like pedal them around. Right. Um. Because yeah. they don't have um. They don't have like those car things at the Portland airport. Right. I was like let's have ped bikes. I didn't realize that. And they were yeah. like I was like and then I'll go pick people up at their gates and bring them to get massages. I um, see that. And they were. Yeah, they were like, no. I was like, ah, it's so hard. I have all these great ideas, and you always say no. Um, but, you know, it, it, so there are def- definitely disadvantages, but there are, you know, obviously, like, the traffic advantages. And um, I actually feel like I learned a lot from them about how to be organized around opening a place, too, because we had to have everything laid out beforehand. Mm, right. And that's just obviously not the way we did it the first time. We opened, like, one room at a time. So right. um, I, they gave me a great education in learning how to function in that reality. Yeah. So many, so much to talk about, you know, Brianna, in, in so little time. We only have a few minutes. I, I really wanted to get into what possessed you to open a third location, but we're not going to get to that. Um, <laughs> but I want to point people towards a couple websites and also just kind of leave you with whatever final words or lessons um, we should take away. Um, people can go to the dragon, the dragon tree.com. They can go to Brianna Borton, B R I A N A B O R T E N.com. Where else should we point people towards for the book? Obviously they can go on Amazon for the well life, any other places they can find the book or other things they should check out. Yeah, you can come to thewelllife.com mm. and you can okay. like see our cute little video of us um, and then read about the book. You can also download a free chapter there, cool. um, which is fun if you are interested. Yeah. Um, you can also order the book. If you order the book there, you get the free course with it, which is great. Nice. Um, it's a really great course and it's, um, you know, there's eight modules and we try to make it um, easy to do and reflect upon and short exercises for you to do in between the modules. Yeah. And um, yeah, you can also go to dreambook.vision if you're interested in the dream book. You can also find that on our Dragon Tree website. But yeah. um, it's uh, useful to just be able to, if you want to go straight there. So yeah, those are all the places you can find us. So we talked about a lot. What should we leave people with uh, so far from your journey? You know, I guess the main thing I would say is, like, from my journey is just to try to have as much perspective as you can, mm-hmm. because I think that so often we get bogged down with the daily kind of grind of things, or feeling like if this deal doesn't go through, my life will end, or if this business doesn't succeed, things are going to be so bad. Um, and one of the things that I've done my whole life it's just like an innate thing that I've always done is always to have my worst case scenario in my head and get really okay with it. Yeah. Cause my worst case scenario, you know, used to be, you know, I'd be a waitress. I'm like a great waitress actually. Okay. I'm like, I'd be a waitress. We'd live in a tiny apartment. I would still have my family and it would be okay. Right. Right. And now my worst case scenario keeps getting upgraded, which I feel really grateful for because people are like, okay, because I tell people this and they're like, actually, can you work for me? Can you run my business? Can you, you know, be my business partner? So now my worst case scenario is like much better um, than that. But at the same time, I think that so often we won't take risks because we're so afraid of losing what we've built. Mm -hmm, And mm -hmm. 
Yeah. I am a huge risk taker because I know that like the fundamental things that matter to me can't be taken away mm-hmm. by any of those risks. Like right. I wouldn't risk my family's life or my life, but I'm totally willing to risk lots in my business yeah. because the fundamental things that make me happy don't have anything to do with that. Right. And so I guess I would just say if you feel like you are adverse to taking risk or if you are constantly worried about things to just get some perspective around what it is that you know you're doing and also around what is the worst possible thing that could happen because it's often not as bad as we think yeah i love that brown thank you so much it's an absolute pleasure i want to be the first one and and thank you thank you so much for having me have a wonderful All right, day. You too. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.